One of the greatest whodunits in physics history is the case of the missing antimatter. Paul Dirac famously predicted antimatter when he developed his eponymous equation for electrons. The equation predicted a mysterious particle with the opposite charge from the electron. He suggested the only positively charged particle he knew at the time, the proton, but it turned out to be the positron, the electron's antiparticle. The equation is symmetric in those particles, meaning that there is no distinguishing feature that makes matter more important or more prevalent than antimatter. That begs the question, where is all the missing antimatter in the universe? This problem has a name, baryon asymmetry, and it is a major open problem in both particle and cosmology physics. Some have hypothesized that the missing antimatter is because of some asymmetry in the universe. Others think that our universe must have a twin antimatter universe out there somewhere. Perhaps the antimatter might be just beyond the observable universe. Perhaps antimatter is gravitationally repulsed by matter and so stays far away from it, yet out there somewhere are whole antimatter stars and planets. I suspect that the reason we don't see antimatter is actually much simpler and more intuitive than that. But in order to understand the answer, you have to understand something about antimatter, what it is, and how it relates to matter. First off, every particle has an antimatter counterpart. For some particles, like photons, that counterpart is itself. For others, like electrons, the counterpart, the positron, is only seen in particle accelerators and cosmic rays, where high energies create them out of other particles. Elementary particles, meaning particles that, as far as we know, cannot be subdivided into smaller component particles include electrons, positrons, and quarks of matter and antimatter. These are the most basic examples of fermions, particles with spin that are a multiple of one by two. As far as we know, fermions are never their own antiparticles. But Majorana, a brilliant physicist who vanished under mysterious circumstances, theorized that they could exist. We have been looking for Majorana fermions ever since, and I'll get to why in a bit. Every particle has a spin, which is a quantum version of angular momentum. Particles don't spin like tops. Instead, they possess angular momentum as a discrete quantity coming in multiples of either 0, 1, or 1 by 2. Spin is responsible for charged particles having a magnetic field. When spins line up in a solid object, you get weird effects like permanent magnets. As an aside, one way to think about spin is as a symmetry. If a particle has spin 1, that means it has rotational symmetry of one full revolution. An office chair, for example, has 360 degree symmetry, so it looks the same if you rotate it once. If something has spin 2, such as the hypothetical graviton, then it has 180 degree symmetry. An oval table has a 180 degree symmetry. A spin 4 particle will have 90 degree symmetry like a square table. A spin 0 particle, on the other hand, is like a featureless sphere. It looks the same from any rotation. Spin 1 by 2 have a 720 degree symmetry, meaning you have to rotate them twice before they look the same. Atoms are made of fermions primarily with some of their mass energy coming from binding forces, which themselves aren't composed of real particles. So when we talk about the missing antimatter problem, we are mainly talking about missing atoms of antimatter to match the matter atoms we know and love. In physics, matter and antimatter are related by a symmetry called the charge parity time, CPT symmetry. We know that for a given charged matter particle like an electron, its antimatter counterpart will have the opposite positive charge. That is why we call them positrons. A parity transformation means taking a mirror image of a particle in one or more spatial dimensions. Massive fermions are not symmetric under parity transformations alone. Another word for this is that they do not have chiral symmetry. That means there are left and right-handed electrons. The reason we don't hear about it much is because they don't behave differently except with respect to the weak force responsible for radioactive decay. 
In ordinary electromagnetism, they are no different from one another. The third symmetry is time, meaning time reversal. This is effectively like parity, but for time. So instead of particles propagating from the past into the future, you have particles propagating from the future into the past. If you reverse a particle's charge, you get its antiparticle. But if you also reverse parity and time, you get the particle back again. And that is interesting because if you know that the positron is simply the same as the electron, but reversed under parity and time, then a positron is no different physically than an electron going back in time. High energy collisions of particles, such as you find in particle accelerators, create particles and antiparticles in pairs. You can even create them using a powerful enough laser which effectively produces them out of nothing. An electron and positron, once created, will move apart a bit, then, because of their mutual electromagnetic attraction, fall back together. When they collide, they will produce a couple of photons, light. If you draw what that looks like on something called a space-time, since the positron is just an electron going back in time, therefore, instead of having two particles, it looks like you only have one moving in a circle in space and time, a closed loop. This will be important for the argument to where all that antimatter is. During the Big Bang, we would expect equal amounts matter and antimatter to be created. The standard model of particle physics is symmetric in terms of the two. There are a couple ways to answer this question. There are asymmetries beyond the standard model of particle physics that we don't know about. The antimatter is out there somewhere. There are a few beyond the standard model ideas that introduce asymmetry. One of the most prominent involves heavy neutrinos, which are neutrinos with masses larger than the ones we know about. Heavy Majorana neutrinos are neutrinos that are their own antimatter, but also have mass. These would have decayed very early on during the Big Bang and created an asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Heavy neutrinos are also a candidate for dark matter, and, if they were ever discovered, it would be huge. Some more fanciful ideas propose that the Big Bang actually produced two universes, one propagating from the Big Bang into the future, and the other propagating into the past. This makes use of the CPT symmetry connection between matter and antimatter, of course. The idea is actually simpler than this, and does not require any modifications to the standard model or extra universes or any antimatter being out there somewhere. Instead, it relies on a mathematical transformation that has been used for 2000 years. It is called stereographic projection. Stereographic projection has three nifty features. Circles on the plane are circles on the sphere. If you imagine the space-time, you can map that to the sphere. In other words, the apparent symmetry between matter and antimatter that occurs in particle pair creation and annihilation is actually still there on the sphere for matter alone provided that matter does not come from a creation event, a finite distance in the past. The reason we don't observe the antiparticle is because the particle never travels back in time on the space-time plane. The radius of curvature of the circle is infinite. Alternatively, you can get this by starting with a pair creation annihilation loop and sending the creation and annihilation events to the infinite past and future. Meanwhile, you send the antimatter part of the loop to the infinite distance. In the limit, the antimatter vanishes. Remember, in both cases, for finite creation and annihilation pairs, and with ordinary particles formed in the Big Bang, the particle and antiparticle are the same particle. We are just viewing them at a different point in their circular trajectory in space-time. Now, if the particles were actually created in the Big Bang, this might be a problem because the Big Bang was a finite period of time ago. But we aren't saying that precisely. All we know is that there was a hot, dense period about 13.8 billion years ago. We don't really know what was before that, or if that even has a meaningful definition. Keep in mind that our space-time plane is not static, but is stretching in space, and perhaps in time as well. So, the Big Bang may be effectively an infinite temporal distance in the past.
This is a feature of, for example, logarithmic time, which Isaac Asimov promoted. In order to demonstrate this concept, we would have to know a lot more about the Big Bang than we do, and how matter, especially fermions, emerged from it. But if correct, then we may never get any answers from particle accelerators for why there is more matter than antimatter in the universe because you would have to be at the beginning of time or the end to find out. Thank you so much for watching. See you again in the next video. Until then, as always, keep looking up, stay curious, and dream big.